So Patrick is, uh, is representing a, a company named Speed Data that is uh, doing uh, stuff around uh, publishing in Germany. And here is the presentation. Just one second. Okay. My name is Patrick Gundlach, and I'm the head of a small company based in Berlin, and we are, do our business in the XML2 PDF workflow, or XML2 PDF area, which is always, um, sometimes called database publishing. And um, I have written an open source software, which is uh, doing XML2 PDF workflow. And I would like to show you the motivation behind uh, creating another implementation, creating another standard. Uh, Mohammed already said that, um, oh, well, another standard, <laughs> because all the old, old standards don't work. And now we have one more standard that don't work. So I hope that's not the case. And the presentation has an abstract title. And I think in this audience, I could also go with a, another title. Oh, I hope my, yes, that's uh, XLFO++ or XSLFO Next Generation. But since I'm not using XSLFO, and my implementation is incompatible with XSLFO, I rather go with the title I've given. <clears throat> before I go into detail, and before I'm going to show you a Hello World example of my implementation, I would like to uh, talk about design routes and talk about the motivation why I uh, did another approach on it. And uh, the first topic is design routes and what are design routes? Design routes are instructions to a user uh, how to display something on, on paper, for example. There can be font phase, font usage, colors, margin, paper size. But I'm, I'm focusing on something else. And this is a very simple catalog from um, car accessories. It's very simple. It's, uh, it has a very simple design rule. It's written there. It's, uh, if a new product group comes, then we should insert a page break. There's a very sim simple design rule. It's if new product group, then do this and that. The second example I want to show is also a very simple catalog. And the design rule here again, uh, also very clear, always five products on a page. I'm going to neglect the case where the five products themselves are too large to fit on the page, um, which I still covered here. There's five products on a page. Then do a page break, and then the next page. Also very easy design rule. <coughs> the next design rule is a bit more complex. It's um, an example from a catalog uh, from Lightning area. Lighting area, sorry. <laughs> and uh, this is German catalog, and this is the same page from the French catalog. And there are also, I think, 10 more, or altogether 10 languages, um, which have basically or is more or less the same layout. And the problem now here is so if we typeset the text, or if we arrange a page, the elements on the page, like the table below, below the first text, and the images depend on the size of the text in every language, in the longest language. So we need to typeset the text, find out how big the text is, and in this case, um, how big the text in every language is. And then we know where to place the table and the images and the other products. So the design rule can be uh, written something like, Space for text must take all languages into account. And the fourth and last example is a very complex uh, rule. It's actually very simple in this case. You just maximize uh, page, page usage. And this is from um, a classical or typical consumer product. And let's assume we want to fit another product on each of these pages. 
we need to rearrange the, the products which are on the page. We might uh, make the images smaller. We might um, typeset the page in a smaller font size. We might uh, remove the images that are not really necessary to the uh, page itself, just to fit another uh, product on that page. So the, the rule, if we want to fit another product on the page because we want to optimize the page numbers in the catalog, this might be uh, very easy in a desktop publishing surrounding, but it's very hard to do in a fully automatic uh, setting. It's um, not impossible, but it's, I don't know how to do it at the current time without uh, our product. Okay, let me rephrase the four design rules I've given. Well, just write them down here. And I think we can put the design rules into two groups. The first two design rules are what I would call static design rules. And the last two design rules are dynamic design rules. And this is because the static de design rules can be implemented before we give the data or the, the layout to the renderer. And then the second two design rules, the dynamic design rules, we need to ask the renderer how big is the text? What space does it take? Um, does it fit on the page? We need to really talk to the renderer. And we need to decide, or if then else, like a clause like this, if it fits on the page, then do this, um, unless this and this happens. So there needs to be a very close communication between the layout instruction and the renderer, in the second case, the dynamic design rules. Okay, this is um, our product page, uh, pr product presentation I'm not allowed to do. No, this looks like a, a access, typical XSLFO workflow. We have XML data and get out PDF, but the difference to XSLFO in our case is that the layout instructions are separated from the data. We pass in XML data, read X, uh, layout instructions also formulated in XML, and then do something with it. So that's the difference to XSLFO, one of the differences. Let me put it in other words, or in other schema. With XSLFO, we use mostly XSLT to combine the data and the layout, and then put it on the renderer, and then we get a PDF in our case. In our approach, we interpret the layout instructions inside the renderer. And I've marked the most, where the logic is, where the most work is. It's like here in the XLT mostly, and in, here in our case in the layout instructions. To put it in other words, which is not strictly true, but uh, I hope you get the point. With XSLFO, layout is known before the text is converted to PDF. Not really strictly true, but more or less. And with our approach, the layout is interpreted within the renderer. OK, now I'm going to show you a very simple example, Hello World. And we start with a data XML file, which is just a root element called data. It can be anything. In this example, it's data and has an attribute, hello world. And um, it can have, of course, some child elements, which is not important here in the hello world example. And the layout file, which we read, could look like this. This is an actual working layout file, except for the namespace. I've omitted it because it's too long. And now what we do is, um, the publisher, what it does is it reads the layout file altogether. And it first looks at some global definitions like font face and colors and page layout, margins. And then it starts looking for these record elements, where they are. And then it starts reading the data. And when we get to the root element, it looks into the layout instruction file where we find record element equals in the name of the root element. And then we 
execute the instructions which are inside the record element. And in this case, we only have one instruction, which is place object. It places something in the PDF, which can be a text, table, image, barcode, and some other elements. In this case, it's just a text block with a given width and one paragraph with hello world in it. Now, since we're talking about database publishing, this should be more or less like this. We have access to the attributes and child elements. This looks like XPath, and indeed, we try to fully implement XPath, the XPath standard. We're not there yet. We have only a very small subset yet, but we are expanding. And this is a Hello World example where we access the data, the attribute here in the um, data XML, and types it. it. Now, before I can show you the principle and how we do the dynamic optimization, I would like to introduce two concepts to understand how we work with the optimization. And the first concept is uh, so-called virtual pages. I'm coming from a tech background, the tech typesetting system, and there we use this all the time, the virtual pages that are um, exactly like this. And that's actually what implementation is based on. The objects, so we can place objects into a virtual page, and the page starts out with a dimension of zero. And as soon as we place objects in there, the virtual page dimensions grow. Let's say I have a text placed on a virtual page. The page has exactly the dimension of the used space of the text. The renderer doesn't make a difference if it's put it in the text in the PDF or onto the virtual page. So I know exactly the size of the text we have uh, given. Now we place an image, and the size of the virtual page increases, of course. And we place another text, and the size of the virtual page takes up the amount I've used. This is the first concept, and the second concept is page grid. Page grid is known, well, well known in, data, uh, in desktop publishing systems, and probably a lot older than that. And we can use the page grid to place objects in a coordinate system. We can say, OK, row 2, column 5, and then place a table there. But we can also use it to get the dynamic layout optimization. And we have, um, when we place text on a grid, we can find out how large it is by looking which grid cells are allocated by the text. We can find about that. Now, with these two combinations together, uh, these two um, <coughs> concepts together, uh, allows us to do the dynamic optimization. And I'm going to show you a very simple example. OK, how does it work? We place something on the virtual page, and um, the virtual page expands by its contents. Then we can find out about the dimensions, um, exact um, criterion, and then we decide uh, either to drop the virtual page or to place it into the PDF. Now we have two helper functions, really simple. We can get the height and the width of the virtual page. And this alone is a very powerful concept to decide, okay, is it, does the text fit, or does text plus image fit on the page or not? Or what is the largest text in all the um, languages, like I've shown in the third example? Now, an example which, is, which uses this concept. Assume we have only a very limited space available on a page, and we want to put the text there and find out, OK, does the text fit in there, or what can we do if it doesn't fit in there? I'm not sure. No, you cannot see it. This is a sample grid, and we want to make sure that the text fits in the area above my hand. And this should be free because we want to place an image there. So what we do is we put text in this virtual page. 
And now we can see optically, but um, not in the program yet, that it, uh, it's too long. So we need to do something. And in my sample application, I would uh, reduce the font size of the text until it fits in the 3 times 4 grid. And um, if it still doesn't fit in the area, I would issue a warning. OK, I think um, this is another wording of the example. No, it doesn't work here. OK, first I would, I would typeset the text in 10-point font with a width of three grid cells, as I've seen shown before. And now I query the renderer. I talk to the renderer. Does it fit um, in the 3 times 4 grid? So is the height of the virtual page less or equal than 4, which is uh, in grid cells? And if not, we retype set or recreate the text with a smaller font. And then we output it um, if it still doesn't fit, but give a warning message. This is just a very simple sample application um, to show you the, the <coughs> mechanism. It could be much more complex. OK, this is the implementation of it. We, the middle, uh, middle part, you would um, recognize. We place an object, a text block of our sample text with a grid cell width of three in some predefined font I've, I've not shown here. And we do not put this into the PDF. We place this in the virtual page, which is called group in my case. And I'm not happy with the name. So if some, someone with more proficient English knowledge uh, comes up with a better name for these um, virtual pages, which is very small or concise name, I would be happy to hear. And we place it onto, into the group, into the virtual page, and nothing is output into the PDF yet. So this is what our um, the next slide we see what we do. Now we have a simple if and else clause. It, um, it checks. This is the first case above uh, on the top. We check if the height of our group of the virtual page is less or equal than four. If this is true, we execute the first statement there. We place the object. <clears throat> we place a per, um, the virtual page in the PDF, which is done by place object. And if not, which is the otherwise case, it's too large. So we, we typed it in a small font. We just do another place object with a text block, as seen before, with a smaller font face. And that's um, then we issue a message. And that's about it. That's a very, as I said, a very simple example because the more complex examples would be like uh, this large. Um, but this is a very powerful mechanism. Now I would like to talk about the layout instructions, the, the, the language itself. The language, as I've seen, or if you've seen before, is um, XML based and we use a relaxing schema. We have, um, it started with the German instructions. So what you've seen here is relatively new. And because um, it's easier to sell it or to people um, if they're familiar with words, unless you're a programmer. If you're a programmer, then you can see, oh, OK, switch other case otherwise, and you're familiar with the terms. But um, if you're not into programming, and you see English language, and you're not familiar with it, then you might be scared away. So we started with a German implementation, a German layout language. And now we have a dual language. And it would be very easy to add another language. Now the problem with that we encounter is there is no standard. There is no markup standard for such dynamically optimization problem in page media. So we actually don't know really what we're doing. Uh, if we're doing a heading in the right way or if we're heading in the wrong way, it works. It's, um, it's, it's we have a fully working implementation, so it can be used in day-to-day -day publishing. But uh, we use many different standards. I'll show you here. We take parts from XSLT, XPath, CSS, HTML, and um, 
we use our own functions. And there's really a mixture of different um, standards in the XML world, which is actually fine because you recognize things um, when you're programming it, but there might be a much better solution for that problem, kind of problem. And it's a complete programming language with variables, loops, conditionals, so we can, in theory, do anything we want to do. It might get large and uh, very complex, but it is possible. And we support uh, XML standards like XPROC and XINCLUDE. Um, I'm not going to explain it here with this. Now, some technical data. This is a product presentation. <laughs> now you can cross download it. It's an implementation like XSLFO. It works in the background, so it's fully automatic. It's had no, it has, doesn't have any user interaction, and it's um, based on tech. It's a typesetting, very old typesetting system, and there's a modern variant called Lua Tech, which, is, which allows us to use a special mode um, to directly write the PDF. We only use type um, the paragraph builder, and image and font loader from Tech, and we do not use the Tech input language. But it's very convenient to use uh, Lua Tech as a backend because we can program it in Lua. It's because it's based on Tech, it has a very high speed. We usually start with a less than half a second or less than third second um, for the first page. It surely depends on the amount of fonts you load and the optimization you do. Then. The, the speed will decrease because it's, so we use a multipass solution to generate a table of contents and other cross-reference tables. It's, as I said before, it's an open source license. We can download it from GitHub. We provide the source code and ready to run zip files. You just uh, download them, extract them, set your path environment variable and then you can run it. And uh, the programming in the backend is almost completely in Lua, which is a very nice and uh, concise language. And the front end, as I've shown you, is uh, XML and XPath. And we are a bit proud of it. We have complete user's manual, although I have to admit uh, that the English translation is not complete yet. I'm really working hard on it to get it done by the next week. OK, we have a second last slide. Um, now, why this talk? I sh maybe I should put it in the first slide. I would like to start the discussion. But this, the discussion is already going on. Um, how would the standard for such a dynamic language look like? This is a really interesting question. Now. Um, inspire the audience to come up with an alternative implementation or alternative ideas. And the third reason is, of course, to gain popularity so I can get more contributions, more bug reports, better documentation. I'm not a native speaker of English, and uh, I'm not sure how an Englishman would react when <laughs> reading my documents. I said, oh, no, you can't write like this. Um, <coughs> OK, this is the last slide. Um, you can get more information on this GitHub page. And of course, just drop me an email. Thank you for listening. So we have, we have. One, two. We have five minutes for a question. Yeah, I see Alex in the back. It was tweeting some nasty stuff about 6SLFO. And then me. Oh, sorry. Where are you? OK, yeah. So I just have a general procedural question, which is the access IFO activity ended because of lack of participation. So these like, the Don't move your hand. Put, put the microphone on. Uh, no. no, I think it's uh, on, but yes, uh, right. So anyway, so the access IFO activity ended because of lack of participation. Yeah. So there is no more to do there, and there is an interest to standardize these kinds of things, even though it's very interesting stuff. Um, but you know, standardization is a huge task. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I think the problem space is um, 
it's an urgent problem because um, we still need to produce page media. Maybe in 20 years or in 50 years we don't, but currently we do need to produce page media and we have a demand to automate, automate things. And we cannot do many applications, or many applications cannot be done in Excel flow. So we need to do some standardized workflow, even if, if it's not standardized by some formal, com formal committee. But um, I think the discussion helps. I think the discussion on um, what are our problems, how do we solve it, uh, helps. I can, of course, go along without uh, talking to the XML community and still would be fine, but um, I think it would help me to understand the problem better, although I have an understanding of the problem, but I, I think more input would be great for all. And even if the result is not a formal standard, I think the discussion is very good. I hope, uh, I'm not sure if it um, answers your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know how old your product is, but uh, are you aware about XSLFO 2.0 uh, requirements and draft? Because uh, many of your use cases are at least designed, yes. even if not implemented in a real product like copy fitting and yeah. changing font size to fit some That's page true. size. The, the example I gave with the decrease of font size uh, so it fits on the page is also handled by XLFO 2.0 or should be handled. Um, but I think the problem space is, can be arbitrarily complex. And it, it's not just a font size. It was a, just a, an example, a um, simple example. The, the fourth um, design rule I gave, the fourth example, like rearrange the page so that the sixth product fits on the or one more product fits on the page. So you have to do this and this and this. Um, is not absolutely not uh, covered by any Excel of O2 standard because the um, integration, the complex or the, the tight integration between the renderer and the layout instructions is not possible in Excel of O, which is a very much one way. Yeah, maybe it would be nice if you can s summarize somewhere what is missing yeah. in XSL 2.0 and then the community can decide if like XSLFO can be extended in some future yeah. version. I just, if there is even be future or, or if something completely different like uh, your approach has to be devoted for a future of uh, digital typesetting. Yeah. I just started um, being active on the mailing list PPL um, which uh, Tony Graham... You started yesterday to be active, yes. to be honest. <laughs> yesterday, yes. <laughs> and, um, no, it was the day before yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Graham is the chair of the um, group, and you can, maybe you can say a word, you just have a micro in your hand. Yeah, uh, thank you. Patrick, yes, Patrick, um, I don't know whether he felt guilty or he wanted to publicize his thing, but he posted on the um, mailing list for the print and page layout community group at the W3C. Um, the sad truth, as Alex said, is that the um, XML print and page layout working group has its charters expired due to lack of um, paying members of the W3C. Uh, I, I don't see the print and page layout commu community group as being sort of the caretaker of XSLFO. I think it's a place where we can discuss um, page layout from XML and other technologies. So Patrick's contributions are certainly welcome there, as would anybody else's. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I, uh, it's very interesting for the, this presentation because it seems like today we have a, a lot of presentation presenting open source product, uh, even even with surprise for Saxon CE for this morning, for example. And the, uh, I jumped with the link with Saxon CE because I think what you're presenting is you saying that XSLFO is static and you want something dynamic. And uh, Saxon CE yeah. is introducing a new interactive model. It might be sac this interactive model plus, plus XSLFO that might be a, a solution. So instead yeah. of creating a new language, probably just extending CSLT and having FO discussing together yeah. might give a solution. That's a great thought. I, I didn't have the connection yet yeah. between the CE and uh, my application. Great. Okay. So, next step, next presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, turn it off. Oh. Sorry, another another question. Yeah. Yeah. Just 
A, a lot of the requirements now that FO is covered are starting to be picked up by the CSS3. And if you look at the CSS3 specification, it pretty much accommodates everything that FO accommodates now. Yeah. And then you add vendor extensions on it or other extensions, and you get very close to where you want to go for most cases. But in no case is it ever designed for any kind of interactivity to do, you know, that, that human page layout. Uh, some people achieve it by multi-pass, but it, it's not in design. It's not a desktop publishing system. Yeah. But so. my, my um, I want to be able to drop InDesign completely and uh, use an automatic workflow. In theory, in theory, at least. So things that are not able in a CSS, like the last example I gave, rearrange a page. There's still some application that uses that have this demand. And and another point is that when you say CSS free, which which specification are you talking about? Because I think there is at least four different specification about printed layout. So. So a page layout, at least. So CGPM, page layout, and yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the EDID is to, I just rephrase what you say. I think you're saying that we should look at the standards to build upon instead of something else. No? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I mean, if you start dividing your attention among lots yeah, yeah. of pieces, then no one piece is going to ever be completed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Makes, sense. <laughs> Makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah, I know your, your problem. Um, and I know also people that are telling me that uh, they have already been solved in these old-fashioned typesetting programs like Swivy2 and Xivision. Uh, but these are not standards, and these are not XML. They have slight XML awareness, but but the thing is that you could look at those Mastodon programs, <laughs> so to speak, and you mean, you mean see how, they, how they deal it, deal with it, and they deal with it by means of callbacks. And that's exactly what Mohammed is saying. Uh, add some callback facility like Saxon CE to XSLFO and see where you get. That's, that's yeah, I agree with you. Hmm? OK. Good. Any other questions? Okay, so I think, thank you.